Welcome to Grokchain Conversations. This podcast is presented by a multidisciplinary group of legal, financial, and technology professionals to meet and discuss today's most pressing questions around the use and governance of the blockchain. Through roundtable dialogue, we will provide listeners with a full spectrum of views on where this technology is today and where it might be leading. The information provided on the Grokchain Conversations is for educational purposes only. The information provided does not constitute legal, investment, financial, tax, accounting, or any other professionally licensed advice. The views expressed here are those of the individuals, not those of their respective employers or Grok Chain. All right. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us all again. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the differences between art and utility and NFTs, uh, a, a, a rich topic. Uh, one that will probably take us down a lot of different avenues, give, given our other conversations. Um, and uh, uh, we are fortunate today to have an international cast of panel members with a, a pretty wide range of perspectives. Uh, their links to their backgrounds will be uh, available with this audio and video. Uh, but just to give you a brief background, we've got Fab here with us. I was uh, head of research at State Box, among various other uh, roles. Uh, we've got Andrej Muzovic, director, advisor, and partner at various technology endeavors. I can't even get my arms around all, all of them. Uh, we have uh, Jen Maisel, who's a computer scientist and litigator here in the United States. Uh, and we have Alessandro Daliani, again, the long uh, list of things he's been involved with, but I, I'd say beginning with uh, a former CEO, consultant, and leadership coach with experience in multiple industries uh, and an abiding interest in this uh, uh, crypto and blockchain industry. So, as I mentioned, we're here today to talk about NFTs. A lot of people are trying uh, to understand what they're about. Um, this is not meant to entirely be a primer for the basic person, but we are hoping to get kind of a deep and understandable um, idea of uh, uh, what they are, what they mean, why, sh why we should care. Now, I, I want to start off talking with Fab. As I mentioned, uh, there, there, there's a difference between art and utility and NFTs. I was wondering if, if you could kind of describe that for us a little bit. And from time to time, I may steer us back to some of the uh, uh, other uh, issues that our friend in posing this mm. question raised for us. So go ahead, okay. Fab. Uh, probably it could be useful to give like a very brief historical account of, you know, how NFTs came to be. Uh, Re we, regale us. Okay, so we started, you know, by having just the, what we now call layer one blockchains, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, that are blockchains with their own coin that, you know, is used on the chain. Then with coins like um, Ethereum, uh, you know, there are blockchains like Ethereum that basically give you capabilities of, of writing uh, smart contracts that are pieces of code that are executed on chain in a decentralized and often a trustless fashion. As soon as you have that, people figured out that, hey, we can use smart contracts to represent secondary assets on the chain. How do you do that? You just do a smart contract that is basically a ledger that says, okay, you basically are mapping to each address a number that represents how many tokens that address holds of a given sort. And then you implement some transfer functions, for instance. And this thing came to be known as uh, the ERC-20 token standard. So every token, uh, ERC-20 token follows like a template where you know, for each address, you have a record of how many tokens that address owns. And then there are some functions that addresses and so wallets can use to transfer their tokens to other addresses. So, you know, this is basically the most basic kind of infrastructure. It allows you to uh, represent some assets and implement, you know, all the minimum stuff you need to ensure that those assets are transferable and hence tradable. Um, in particular, ERC-20 tokens are fungible. That means uh, that, you know, we do not really distinguish between two uh, tokens. I, I'm just keeping track that, for instance, uh, Alessandro 
owns three tokens. So these tokens are indistinguishable. If Alessandro owns three and I own two and we exchange these tokens with each other, uh, I give him one, he gives one to me, nothing changes. Like the, the, the amounts are the same and the tokens are indistinguishable. Then, you know, people started thinking about, okay, what if we want to represent something more involved, like some sort of collectibles or, you know, uh, unique art pieces or things like that. In this case, fungibility is a problem because obviously if you, you know, imagine collectible cards, for instance, one card and another card could be different cards. So you can't use this model any, anymore. And this is how the ERC-721 standard came, uh, came out that is also known uh, as NFTs. And this exactly takes away fungibility. So now we are not anymore just keeping a record of how many tokens everyone owns, but we are also distinguishing between these tokens. But, you know, morally is, is the same thing. Like an NFT is just like the bare minimum infrastructure to keep track of these tokens and being able to provide the ability to transfer them and to transact uh, them uh, with other wallets. So this is like the basic infrastructure that uh, that is run NFTs. Then, as you will, uh, mm -hmm. uh, one second. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt you. Is there a difference between what you would call an NFT as a token that's on a private network, like we'll call you know the um, uh, Facebook Metaverse? or something that's on a distributed network like Ethereum or some other distributed network? Is there I a substantial really, difference between the two? I really not? think it depends who you ask to, because if you ask, for instance- well, I'm asking to, uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I mean is if you ask to, quote unquote, uh, you know, pure developer, they may tell you, well, for me, an NFT is anything that abides to the ERC-721 standard or ERC-1155 standard. So they say, okay, for me, the NFT means a template that your smart contract has to follow. In that case, you know, if Facebook implements this template in a very similar way, they may, you know, believe that, no, they are the same thing. Um, but I, you know, from uh, a more like economic point of view, for instance, uh, I think there are differences. For instance, for me, it would feel very different to have assets on, on a chain that, you know, is privately uh, owned and even worse where, you know, the owner can basically decide to roll back transactions. So, and, you know, you said this. Or they can cancel your EFT or your net, your- Exactly. Your, all sorry, your NFT or the- even if we have to be no, they can careful. censor you for all intents and purposes. Yeah, but this is a very debatable point because uh, we are seeing this with OpenSea at the moment. Basically, mm -hmm. these NFTs are transacted on some marketplaces like OpenSea, Rarible, Foundation, and others. These are basically companies. Uh, and so they may decide to obscure your NFTs. So, for instance, if you create you know, an NFT, uh, by stealing some copyright, uh, intellectual property by someone else, uh, basically OpenSea could say, okay, you are not able anymore to see or transact this thing using our marketplace. Then obviously you can still resort to like off the counter transactions, but practically what happens is that, you know, the public perception is that that NFT has been erased because literally you cannot see it anywhere. So you still have the asset from a pure blockchain perspective, but. So when you say you don't see the asset anymore, you're saying you don't see your token anymore. It's not in your wallet or you don't see whatever. So yeah. Uh, artwork so, is it's pointing to or whatever it's pointing to. Imagine whether it's it artwork like, or something else. Imagine it like this. We have a blockchain that we can call the backend, and then we have a front end that is what the user sees. Uh, mm -hmm. That could be, for instance, what happens in your browser. The way it works is that you know you have to interface these two things. So the backend at the moment is fully decentralized, uh, trustless, whatever, you know, depends on the blockchain, but it's it's kind of reliable. And in that case, in there, 
Like on Ethereum, if someone gives you a token, that token will stay in your wallet forever. But the front end, on the other hand, and all these middleware infrastructure may be very centralized. And so what can happen is that, for instance, OpenSea, that is one of the most common services that people use to see their NFTs and to uh, transact them, uh, may decide that they do not want to show you some assets. So even if those assets are present on the blockchain and they are in your wallet, when you log in to your OpenSea account, you won't see them. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely. And you know, from a practical point of view, that really feels like censorship because that's the, I mean, the point is as soon as OpenSea decides to do something like that, the value of the NFTs uh, that are being censored obviously goes down by a lot. Of course, of course. It's now, just like, yeah. I have to ask another question because um, just to understand what we're talking about, because you know, obviously if it's on a private chain, mm -hmm. there's you know, certain security guarantees, but with certain trade-offs like censorship. If it's on an open chain, then you might have uh, no censorship, but you might have high transaction fees. Um, but these are all things that reside on the, on the network as individual tokens. Now, years ago, uh, Primavera di Filippi started this thing with the plantoid, with this uh, sculpture of a, of a flower that was connected to the internet through a smart contract. And that smart contract um, works in such a way that Every time somebody pays a certain amount, I think it was Bitcoin back in the day, maybe mm -hmm. now it takes Ethereum, um, the, the, the flower would thank you. But all of those funds would then be collected in that particular address, the smart contract address. And the, the community could then vote on the next artist, the next iteration of that particular uh, of a, of a new flower, new sculpture, or new plantoid. And this has created a whole bunch of generations of, uh, of sculptures mm -hmm. that artists can live off of, but they exist in the real world. There is no NFT per se, it's the smart contract that manages the, uh, we'll call it the, the, the royalties for lack of a better word. But you um, don't have any ownership in that case, right? That like you just paid a smart contract and maybe you have a say you can vote about how to spend these funds. Uh, I don't know, but like you, you do not own a piece of these, of these artwork, basically. No, but you can no. own the artwork itself. You're not owning, you know, if you want to make, if you want to propose to make the next plant or a plant sculpture, mm -hmm. um, off of one of the many different plants that exist there, you, know, you have to then uh, solicit the community to participate and to allocate those funds to you so that you can then have the money to survive and to get the materials and so on and so yeah. forth. Okay. How, how is membership in the community decided, Alessandro? It's completely free. You know, it's, it's a completely different approach where the um, I'm going to use a terrible expression, but yes, the incentive structure is to make things happen in the real world, not for them to be limited to what's online. Yeah. So all of those all of those problems that you see with uh, you know, someone pointing an NFT token towards a particular file or towards a particular digital or even real object. Um, you know, it's very limiting to what's on the internet, what's actually yeah. online in the digital world. And it, it comes with a, a whole bunch of trade-offs. Now, if you were, I mean, I don't know how Board Apes Yacht Club works, but from some of the smart contracts I've seen, you've only got the royalties that cascade down. You don't have this uh, this pool of money, this uh, liquidity pool that you're creating that then allows the community to say, we're going to fund this next board ape. 
we're going to you know, fund FAB's boarding so that he can do that. So there is no, there is no real community. The type of community participation is more passive in one case and more active in the other. I think in Primavera's <clears throat> case, it's more active. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would argue that stuff like board apes that is absolutely, you know, like the most remunerative kind of NFT art in the market at the moment. It's not even art. Yeah, but I it's, think that it's short term. It's once once the once the flash is gone. Once the, no, the enthusiasm is gone, you know, no for one's me, it's not attention. necessarily that. I think that there's a there's a, a very like. What happened is that, you know, in the beginning, I mean, not really in the beginning, but like in 2019, early 2019, that, that is probably when I heard about the NF NFTs for the first time, we basically had very few individual artists that were producing one-on-one -on -one art. That means they were producing unique works. So you had only one token of, of, of some something, you know. And sometimes they do something more complicated, like a piece made of different parts and you can own a part and decide how this part would appear. And so the, the, the ensemble, uh, the appearing of the piece of the art piece was determined by the choices of the single owners and all this kind of stuff. But then what happened is that uh, people started producing mass producing nfts you know we have all these generative art kind of idea where you say okay i make ten thousand unique pieces by for instance superimposing different layers in a in an image that are randomly chosen uh and you participate to this sort of draft and and for instance you get a board ape and you don't know which board ape you get and, until they are revealed uh these really these kind of things they do not really work like like art in my opinion they really work like fashion the point is that these people figured out that for you know to buy one-on-one -on -one art you really have to analyze the artist's work be competent at understanding you know if that thing is valuable or not it's, it's a way more difficult investment while with things mm -hmm. like board apes you 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 know you hear that oh eminem got a board ape paris hilton got a board ape it's exactly like uh i don't know a rolex watch or a christian dior perfume well, it's something they're two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a piece from what i've read that's a yes. bit more than a rolex watch yeah it's <laughs> like a good patek philippe or depends a on the watch John or whatever you have. Watch. watches <laughs> can, yeah exactly but uh, the point is you can just run after the things and basically follow the herd. And it, it feels to me that this is way more related to fashion and how the fashion industry works. Than oh, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, maybe uh, that's the segue we should get into then. Uh, 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 Andre, I, I was wondering, since we're talking about kind of utilitarian art, can you talk some about the utility applications of, of these, uh, this uh, NFT technology? No, definitely. I, I just like to go a bit back because uh, Fab started with uh, standards, which are critical. Oh, here uh, also, the... Andre, if I can interrupt, yes. I, I, you you are naturally in our conversations, uh, contrary to whatever Fab says. So I want to make sure that I, 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 I leaned in on that. <laughs> so uh, I, I apologize for interrupting your segue, but uh, it, it's also by design. We know that's happening. That's why I called on you. <laughs> so, okay, okay. So, no, no, no. Please. Here, here, here. I agree. I agree with the whole standard standard thing but it's a bit the tricky part starts is like if we go a bit back so the uh, crypto punks as the the first uh, uh, edition this is pre erc 7 to 1 standard and they are the most valuable one for instance as a generative art type of a thing but it's super when we talk about utility it's like it's uh, it's it allows us to put stuff on it, and because it's a standard, it's easily tradable or not tradable if you decide to ban them and so on. But it's interesting that like IP with the uh, CryptoPunks is not within the NFT. So like the IP of the artwork stays with the company. So you're just buying representation of it. Whilst in uh, Board Apes, which are let's say less art because these are the membership in a yacht club so that's the idea so the whole idea of board apes was like what would people that got uh, super rich from crypto like to do like they're bored and they like to ape into things 
So this is a membership club. And the utility of this is like, yes, you can be a member, you can come to spaces which are just reserved for them and so on. It's, but flex. the, it's flexing, the utility but, is flexing. But, but the flexing part comes now to the regulatory part because like when, uh, so I used to lecture international marketing and when we were talking about like when you sponsor someone to represent your brand, like for instance, when uh, 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 Roger Federer shows the Rolex, we know he got, he's sponsored by Rolex. Here, like it's a bit more complex. So did Eminem pay for his board ape? So did the super cringe interview with Paris Hilton, did she really buy this? Because like, if we have this community and we talked about communities like last time, this crypto community behind this NFT as yes. a vehicle, now you add those people that are outside of the community, they are flexing, they're showing money, but they know nothing about the background and now this yeah. is pumping the price in a way which could be or should be regulated because like when we look at the value oh, it is like regulated I'm, uh well okay then it should be enforced even because like all those prices we look at and you said you said 250k can you really that's what sell? i read no 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 it's so so that's that's the that's probably the the accurate demonstration i mean it goes up floor, and down floor. the floor prices of, of this thing. no i know about around about 250 is what i've seen what but it's highly manipulated. The whole market is yeah, highly manipulated. Yeah, because I'm, they're... I'm pretty sure that you know this, uh, but there is this wonderful piece exactly about what you're saying that, you know, basically investigates how many of these very vocal people like uh, Paris Hilton and other people that show their board apes are basically represented by a VIP representation agency that I think is called CAA, if I'm not, if I remember correctly. And basically, it turns out that these representation company also invested in OpenSea. So you see, I mean, right. They, so there's a lot of self-interest going on, and absolutely, are, you know, and that's you not, know. you know, that's not healthy for anybody. Yeah, well, so I mean, let me ask um, with with that. I mean, we're talking about influencers. That's in all sorts of yeah. different industries. With the block, can the blockchain mitigate that influence because of the transparency? I appreciate it may be hard to figure out, you know, if a certain celebrity actually bought their NFT, but can can we trace that in the blockchain? Definitely, well, that's and why, it's happening. Sorry. That, that, sorry, that's why I think Primavera's approach is so much better because you don't have to ask yourself that question because it's all happening in the real world. No, I disagree here, sorry. It's yeah, like, it, it's, I think you're conflating oh, things sorry. because here, here it's like the transparency part here like all these wash trades are super transparent because like it's it's really you can see who does what and like we've seen that even with hacks like blockchains are crazy transparent and yeah. if someone has enough means they really can restructure and find out uh, like even with super interested hackers trying to hide what they did uh, it's possible here it's like apparent and why we're talking about it is because we're seeing it. But when you say connection, when you said connection to the real world, Alfa Romeo is going to add NFTs to each and every car. I don't think that the current NFTs have any limitations and could be fully implemented within what you're saying. So the, the standard mm -hmm. could be fully implemented with what Primavera was doing. It just so hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What do you mean by Alfa Romeo is going to put issue NFTs that represent a car? Yes, so with each Alfa Romeo, you're going to get an NFT, which represents the ownership of the car. So this is the point. Like this so is you're like, going to get a the... title. You, so you're going to put title, your title. But also authentication, I think, Alessandro. So like it, instead of having to rely on independent registry, it's kind of an open blockchain registry of ownership. That because it's an yeah, NFT, you, you, yeah. you could trade along with the title. Well, there, there is utility value to this. This is something Jen and I were talk, talk, talking about yesterday. There are all these existing frameworks for ownership of the uh, authorship or, uh, or authorship of things, like the copyright offices, right? But the way they work is extremely outmoded. Like you send in a copy of the thing, eventually you get a certificate. There's no real way to search this them. Is, this is the first thing we, uh, I personally thought when you know NFTs became popular, that they could be used to... We, we call it in Italy the authentica, that is when basically an artist creates a work of art for you, they have to sign some document that cannot provenance be forged. Language. Yes, okay, uh, provenance, where you know they say, okay, I made this uh, blah, blah, blah. The point is, if you do this using an NFT, 
then the NFT must be transacted along with the work of art when you sell it and that is not forgeable. So that could be a big improvement to, you know, evaluate the authenticity of a work of art. Yeah, sure. when it comes to auth authorship or, or collectibles, right? Like right now we're yeah. using memeable art pieces, yeah. but if it's something like from my nerd background that would be really interesting is comic books, right? Like Absolutely. comic books. To, to be able to uh, to kind of confirm that it's legitimate and the grading of it, so, they seal it up. They seal it up in a box. So you get the, the hard certification of it, but make a lot of sense to have a central registry of that certification mm -hmm. because I prosecuted when I was a prosecutor um, uh, coin frauds, and people would do a similar thing with collectible collectible coins. They put them in a case that's got the grade. The unsavory yeah. people would break them out of the case, create their own case, and sell the fake graded coin. Yeah, uh, but if you've got an NFT, it can't be done because it references back to the same coin. At least if you do the implementation correctly. And I, there's I, a lot of there's a there's a great chance to kind of streamline those markets if we use this mm -hmm. technology the right way. I, I think way. one important thing to keep in mind historically, you see, when uh, ERC twenties uh, fungible tokens were created, there was this idea that this standard would be very useful for something, but people didn't really have any clue about what can be could be done with it. And so, you know, basically we had this ICO craze in 2017 where everyone was tokenizing everything. And there were a lot of projects that were absolutely meaningless and a lot of scams and, you know, money grabs and this kind of stuff. Then uh, the bear market hit hard. And at some point in late 2018, I, I think, people started saying, you know, started thinking, hey, this token standard can be salvaged. We can do something meaningful with it. And ERC-20 is a pillar of DeFi. So basically the centralized finance works by employing ERC-20 to represent your fractional shares in a vault or in some other investment scheme. I think that with NFTs, we will see something very similar. You know, when the standard came out, everyone was very excited, still very excited. And now they are NFTing anything. Alfa Romeo is NFTing cars, so, you know, board apes, whatever, you name it. I'm pretty sure, you know, that this thing will come to an end, but it won't be an end for the standard. It all, it's always works like this. You know, everyone is super excited about something. They try to do anything they can using it. And then many give up and very few people remain and they actually say, hey, let me see what I can really do with this thing. And that's when, you know, the real useful application come out. I am 100% convinced that this will happen with NFTs. Like one stupid thing I was thinking about, like very, very simple. Uh, recently, the new Spider-Man movie came uh, into movie theaters and it was like a worldwide premiere. And there were a lot of friends of mine that, you know, they did anything they could to book a seat at the premiere. And, you know, because they are Spider-Man fans or whatever, they wanted to be able to say, I was there when this happened. You see, it, so proof of attendance and participation, a POAP is what they're yeah, looking you, for, which yeah, is... You, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's fine. That's not... You could use POAP, but you could also, like, use NFTs in the same way. Yeah, you can, you can use NFTs. Sell, you can sell, you know, your uh, movie theater ticket as a collectible, as a memento to other mm -hmm. people. And, yeah, it would, for, for instance, make sense that theaters all around the world would give you an NFT together with your money, your uh, movie ticket. For instance, you know, this is one of the many applications that may look sensible, maybe if implemented correctly. Yeah, so, um, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm really no, excited ahead, about those other applications. I mean, we work with clients; they're putting they're putting cancer research on the blockchain. Um, mm -hmm. All sorts of applications where you want to see um, how things have evolved over time, and the the standard's very flexible just to show provenance and authenticity. And I think there are a lot of really great applications there. Um, I have a question. Um, before you talked about the standard, the ERC-721 standard, um, yes. and there's been some talk about ownership. I, I wanna dig a little bit into the standard and what, what ownership means with respect to these tokens. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it sounds like there are two components. One is an address, the record. Yep. And the second component is the smart contract. So the, the code that executes when you transfer that, mm -hmm. that record. So can you, can you talk a little bit about maybe how the address and the record is different across blockchain platforms as well as, as, well as the code okay. contract? So, I mean, I'm mainly uh, familiar with smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, but I think NFTs are implemented more or less in the same way everywhere. Um, the idea is this, everything is contained in the same smart contract. So you have a smart, let's say that we create an NFT project. Uh, I don't know, we call it uh, whatever, blockchain NFT, okay? Now, we basically deploy a smart contract. This smart contract will have uh, two main components. It is very hand wavy. One will be what we call a mapping that is basically saying for each address, I map, uh, for each address, I have a list of tokens of blockchain tokens that these address owns as i said before nfts are non-fungible so we have to distinguish between tokens which means that every nft will have a unique id so for instance i can say uh, gen address maps to 3 11 42. this means that you know the nft numbered with 3 11 and 42 that you know, may represent different kinds of art or whatever are your tokens. Uh, and each one of the owners will have, uh, you know, a non-empty record of this sort. And then basically the transfer function is, uh, there are various kinds of transfer, but the idea is that it's a function that you can call. And if you own a token, so if you own the token number three, for instance, you can call transfer, tree and then you put Alessandro's address and when this function gets executed tree gets erased from your record and goes into Alessandro's record so everything that the smart contract is really like recording is just like a series of numbers and which address owns those numbers then what those numbers represent this is usually done outside of the smart contract mainly for gas reason so this means that you know carrying out operations on the blockchain is very expensive so we try to offload as much as possible so then you know we build other infrastructure around this that say okay token number three maps to this particular metadata that represents the title the image who produced it and whatever uh, but yeah i mean the the, the concept of ownership in in this in this case really has to be intended as if you own a token you are able to call the transfer function on that token and give it to someone else so it's more than ownership it's like what you really have is the right to transfer and by the way this is another very interesting thing because i think that nfts are not really changing but uh, confirming uh, a trend in the art market that puts emphasis on market and transferability of assets. Uh, there was a very influential person in the NFT space that shared this, this thing recently that was something like, without the right to transact, all your constitutional rights are meaningless. I find it one of the cringiest takes I ever heard in the crypto space. But you see, this really testifies this tendency of conflating like art value with the possibility to transact and to own what you have. But this has not been the case in the past. You know, when, when the Pope uh, asked Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel, that is not something that is inherently transferable. That you may argue that the only way to transfer that art was invading the invading the Holy See, killing the Pope and replacing him with some other king, basically. Or, or yeah. charging tourists to come and visit. Yes, but yeah, <laughs> but you see, like if you, if you go there and you're like, okay, I want to buy the Universal Judgment, you cannot. You like you even if you could maybe have a contract where you have ownership of that thing, you cannot just like physically remove it. 
and you know move it somewhere else like it, it, it will stay in rome basically forever in, in that particular room yeah and, and that, that's the real world dimension alessandro is talking about but but the image matters a lot especially in the modern world right yes. like the Sistine chapel the, the god touching the the actual point where he's touching uh, Adam's hand, mm -hmm. the finger to finger touch, like that image is all over the place. Well, they, they don't actually it. touch. They're close. Well, yeah. But just, just, uh, yeah. and that's an important point because you can never, I guess, yeah. touch God, right? <laughs> but, but well, it's the, actually the creation of Adam. So, yeah. Okay. The, uh, the, the, the gesture, however, with, with the yeah, kind of the look, gesture, hand gesture, no, et cetera. No. Yeah. And, and that image is, is all over the place. And it's probably not by accident that, uh, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. But the Vatican's a member of most of the international copyright uh, conventions. Uh, and, and I imagine that they are able to monetize that image to a certain extent. And maybe that interaction of the online life and the real life thing uh, is where some of the utility of this lies. The, the ability to recoup the image's value online before the memes and other images were unrecoupable. But now if we rely to a certain extent on these infrastructures, you know, maybe the authorship can be uh, re, um, can be compensated in a way it hasn't. Maybe that'll improve the production of art. I don't know, it'll certainly complicate it. I was wondering, Andre, because we, we talked about DeFi for a moment there, Fab was, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the DeFi possibilities for these NFT technologies. Well, DeFi is already reaping the benefits of the ERC-20 standard. And here with the non-fungibility, it could be like a qualifier. Fab had a really good paper about taking it further to like non-transferable tokens, which could be like identifiers. So like this is like in DeFi, uh, this is like where I would, I would, I would see that the use of non-fungible, but there are also other, others. I'm not, I'm not certain it will go this way. Also, I, I'm working on ERCs on other stuff than just DeFi. So I'm not, let's say, the best person to ask about this, but about the IP stuff we, talk, we, we talked before, it's really for the artist. So the yeah. artist all of a sudden like, uh, can create something that gets sold for like 100 bucks and then it goes to crazy figures. And uh, uh, because of the automated uh, uh, function of the NFT, he can still get his cut from the future sales. So this is like a huge innovation. So there are a lot of innovations that in art that are brought here. And for instance, this could be also then applied to DeFi because like you can have a contract done in such a way that like from each, each future transaction, the original uh, uh, owner does get, does get a cut. So it, it allows us to do uh, numerous, uh, numerous, uh, numerous things. The problem is that we're not doing them. The problem is that like at the moment, uh, not all artists are fairly compensated. And uh, to coming to the question of like, it's not about the contract. It was the contract, the smart contract re refers to. So does it refer to me owning the IP to the art? So for instance, when someone does a print on a t-shirt, does it have something to do with my NFT ownership or not? And this is not stated in the in, uh, NFT itself, but referred to because like we still refer to the actual world. Uh, and some of the things, so what happens in the, on the blockchain, all the transactions, they are easy to both track and execute. But there's a lot of implications from uh, coming back to the real world, and we still have real world regulation, real world IP, uh, and uh, uh, disputes uh, which this uh, interconnects with. Uh, uh, and that could be same like mm -hmm. in, 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 in DeFi or traditional FI, but here, I would call for more more regulation, which is strange because it's like we are seeing, as with the ERC twenty in the craze of the ICOs, we are seeing this being abused. So, like NFTs, most of the things published are, at least in some way, scams. Uh, also, like uh, inflating the price, uh, 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 even like in in one in one instance with a flash loan, like we had a half a billion sale for a single NFT, so all visible, but it's like a half a billion changed hands. So you can think of uh, all the possible tax implications, uh, whatever, but this happened. Uh, I think the Fab mentioned before wash trades. Is that what you're seeing with these? Uh, and, where, where Andre, Andre mentioned them, but <laughs> probably it's worth explaining what they are. The idea is actually very simple. That is uh, marketplaces like OpenSea, usually tend to order things according to volume. So an NFT project that gets transacted a lot 
uh, is considered more prominent. You know, they, they consider two things mainly, the volume and what is called the floor price, that is the lowest price with which an NFT in a collection is put on sale. So if we have a collection of 100 items and like, you know, one goes on sale for one eat, two eat, 10 eat, the lowest one, that determines the floor price. It means that, for instance, if the floor price is one eat, you have to pay at least one eat to buy into this collection. Now, for um, an NFT producer, obviously, it is very important to pump these two parameters uh, so that their project becomes more relevant. And one of the ways to do it is by uh, wash trades. That basically means uh, you create your project and you have another wallet that you yourself own. Uh, you put some capital on it and you pretend that you are buying this thing. And basically you are buying it yourself. Um, and, you know, as Andre was saying, since in the, the blockchain is actually very public and it's very easy to track money especially because many of these people don't really know what they're doing so it makes it all like easier uh you can really see that hey wait this wallet received some money from this wallet that the artist owns like 50 days ago and so you can see you know they were yeah. preparing and then you can check the ip addresses against the available metadata and then you can reconcile it back precisely that technique, by the way, is an old fraud technique for any kind of marketplace. It's a it's yeah. a common it's a common feature of securities fraud. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if you ever seen the movie uh, Wolf of Wall Street, where they're talking mm -hmm. about penny stocks, uh, what what they do to pump up the price and the volume, which are the two main metrics they look in penny stock markets, is they they do wash trades back and forth to create the illusion yeah. of volume to make it look like a real stock to walk up prices to a certain floor. Uh, where it, all of a sudden it, it could be, it, it seems like a, uh, a a tradable item in the penny stock world. That's often one dollar, uh, but you know, uh, uh, you're talking but, about one ETH. It, it kind of doesn't matter what the currency is. But I <laughs> I, I, I do believe that this is illegal in the penny stock market, right? It it, it is illegal. It's illegal okay. not just as a securities matter, but it would be illegal in this NFT market uh, as fraud. <laughs> like wire fraud, right? Because what you're doing is you're you're doing false transactions to uh, to get somebody to buy a thing for value. Now it'd be yeah. the strongest be the strongest um, case where you're doing these wash trades to walk it up to a certain value, like, like it, where you want so, to get somebody to buy it for one ETH or whatever so it is. So the law right? already covers these NFT wash yeah. trades. Especially. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. that, that's what Andre was saying. Like we need more regulation or or at least more enforcement. Like that's the space. Like we have, like they have the tools right now. We just have to encourage them to step into it. Uh, mm -hmm. th those wash trades, I would say, are illegal right now under existing U.S. laws. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, that that's all fascinating. Something I want to touch on. We've got about ten minutes left in in, in our mm -hmm. time here. Is because uh, oh. uh, I had a question. Sorry. A oh, question. go ahead. Go ahead. You don't address. mind. Yeah. No. Um, so. Are there any technical limitations to the number of, we'll call it NFTs, that one would create that would exist on chain? Uh, to be more precise, I, I, there's this constant discussion about the database bloat, I think is a, t is a term that's used, mm -hmm. that slows down the network. Yeah. There are even discussions about you know, being able to take, um, we'll call them non-active addresses and put them into a separate database that then you can, you can, mm -hmm. you know, put, you can take out of long-term memory and bring into short-term yeah. memory to use a, a simple term, simple expression. But, you know, I know open ocean, I think open op ocean is a second layer, right? You mean open sea? Oh, open sea, sorry, open sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the second one. No, it's not. So no, it's, it's not, not just a. No, it's, it's open sea is really like a front end marketplace. They operate on Ethereum and I think Polygon, and maybe I think they are, you know, opening to some something else. No, so it's not a second layer. It's a second level, second layer. You have using to imagine Polygon. it as an intermediary, 
it's yeah, an yeah, intermediary yeah. between yeah. you and the blockchain but yeah no but in terms of the in terms of the data layer if it's using the ethereum main chain then yeah. it's bloating the, the uh it's bloating the database yeah. with stuff that's not really trend it's not fluid there's no liquidity to the market in a so, lot of these cases. Whereas I if you're using Polygon or some other second uh, layer two, you're number one, you've got much lower costs, but number two, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, know, you don't really care if that database is getting bloated. So regarding your question, I think there are two, two parameters to, uh, to follow. Uh, one is the space bloat. Basically, is blockchains work by appending blocks to this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's an ever growing kind of, of thing. There were ways to mitigate this, but uh, in this respect, I don't think that NFTs do much harm because an NFT contract is like a few kilobytes. And in the end, you know, where you are transferring tokens and NFTs, you are just like moving a very few numbers in a database. So, like the you know, in, in theory, you could mean something like 100 billion tokens in an NFT project. It wouldn't change a thing. Um, yeah, okay. But uh, there is also another kind of bloating that is much more severe, this gas bloating. Basically, you need to pay gas to, uh, you know, to use the blockchain, to transact on the blockchain. This gas parameter... Uh, is basically, for instance, in, in Ethereum, in the Ethereum blockchain, it means that you have to pay a given number of Ethereum, a fraction of Ethereum usually, to transact. Uh, this works with a sort of auction model. I mean, there are different models to estimate mm -hmm. gas prices and whatever, but the idea is the more people are transacting all at the same time, the more you're going to pay for gas. Right. And for instance, uh, we have seen in the last month Every time there was like a big NFT drops, uh, and a big NFT drop, the blockchain would become basically unusable because everyone was, you know, there and they were boom, pumping up gas prices in the hope to get tokens before they run out. Uh, these are called gas, war, the gas wars in, uh, in the crypto jargon, basically. But this is a problem. Uh, and gas at the moment is being bloated mainly by two things. One is these NFTs uh, gas wars, and the other is uh, arbitrage bots that are a completely uh, like unrelated thing. It's basically about bots that you know do arbitrage to yeah, yeah. make money out of uh, the centralized marketplaces, and in doing so, they pump gas a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, in this respect, it is a problem, and I am a strong believer of the fact that we should not use layer one, especially for chains like Ethereum to transact NFTs, which really shouldn't, is just pointless. But as you, I, when, when I say that, you know, this thing really follows the laws of fashion. This is part of the thing. Like the fact that your tokens live on a blockchain where you have to pay a lot of money to transact them makes them automatically more exclusive. People say, you know, I have... NFTs on layer one, I have to pay $300 to, to, to transfer them or to mint them. This makes them exclusive, which is obviously absolutely stupid. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. So it's very difficult to disincentivate this, especially when people perceive it as a crude value and exclusivity on, on the project they are interested in. Yeah, I mean, that might be a feature of art going back in time, right? Like, there's a reason why people use Sotheby's to do their transactions for arts, right? And their additional yeah. cost. Because they want to pay 35%. Yes, yeah. really. <laughs> they want to pay 35%. One, they're worried. I, but on another level, the buyers are worried about authenticity that gets yeah. delayed. About right. it. But it's Problem also an inefficiency. Right. Uh, it, you're going to have some people who are going to pay those extra fees. Now, the thing I wanted to pivot to momentarily is, is a slightly different subject, but one that seemed fascinating to me. Jen's been writing recently um, about uh, NFTs and AI authorship. And uh, Jen, if, if you could kind of introduce that I to, uh, idea to us briefly. Oh, no. I, AI, AI personhood, is that where we're going? Yeah, we'll, we'll go there, but <laughs> not quite yet. Um, I think it was Bob that brought up generative 
NFTs and generative art's been around a long time. Um, broadly, it's using computers um, semi-autonomously semi to create digital works, whether it's artwork. Um, you know, it became popular a few years ago with deep fake content. So generating, um, you know, voices, you know, voice overlays, um, videos of people doing things. Um, generative, generative media has been really big. And I think uh, generative NFTs, now that we have a market out there, a commercial market that's got, gotten enough attention, I, again, I think we're going to litigate some of these issues. But uh, there is a question about what copyright, if any, you can have in a generative piece of media. At least in the US, you have to have what we call human authorship meaning that you have to have a human that contributed to the creative components of a copyrighted work. And it, I think this segues nicely into what Andre was talking about before, about ownership and copyrights in the real world, because fundamentally, the, the blockchain transaction, you're acquiring a right to transfer a record on the blockchain. Um, at the minimum, those are the rights you're getting. And if there's one takeaway I would give to our listeners out there from a legal perspective is beyond that right, you have to look carefully about you know, those real world implications. What do are, what are the terms of service say from OpenSea? What are the terms of sales say from the owner of the NFT, the creator of the NFT and what they're transferring over to you? Um, I think there's a comparison of CryptoPunks and Bored Apes. Um, I would encourage you all to look at some of the, the NFL, um, NBA, some of those NFTs and what rights, if any, they're actually transferring over to you when you purchase one of those collectibles. So I don't know, there, it's, it's a really interesting space from copyright law and, and what NFTs are doing there. But anyway, the, the generative aspect super interesting to me from the AI perspective. You are also touching a very important point because, uh, yeah, it is true that you are basically getting the right to trans uh, transact. Because, for instance, there's this ongoing meme, you know, in crypto Twitter that's like, I own a bird date. And you're like, okay, uh, right click save, you save the image, I own one as well. And obviously, you don't own the NFT, but the image is out there and everyone can copy it and download it on, on their computer. So, it was very funny to see that some people were absolutely not aware of this and were like, hey, I forbid you to copy and download my board ape. You cannot do that. Or some people really genuinely believe that if they had the NFT, you know, the copying function would be disabled or something like that. This is not the case, you know, because that's just metadata that is attached to the underlying asset that again is just a record in a database. So yeah, it's it's really really funny. Yeah, it's exactly right. And I mean the other the other aspect too is there on the flip side there are really new and interesting revenue streams being generated through NFTs for artists out there. You know, Andre, you talked about resale royalties. You know, so for example, you can put in your smart contract um, whenever you sell whenever anyone sells your NFT, i.e. Um, executes that right to transfer that NFT, some percent of those proceeds could go back to a specific address. You know, there are lots of ways to automate um, kind of resale royalties back to content creators. Um, to Alessandro's point earlier about the, the plant and kind of this collective project, you know, we're seeing all sorts of new ways that nonprofits are fundraising for a cause. You can create an NFT corresponding to I, what I would argue is not an actual asset. It's not, you know, not something that you can own and touch, but maybe an idea or a concept or a cause that you want to support and transact using NFTs to provide money for that cause. So there are all sorts of new revenue streams beyond the copyright issues. Yeah. And I, I think I think we're at our time, everybody, to, to semi sum up back to the original question posed by our friend. Yeah, you know, the difference between art and utility, I think kind of where we're centering on, and I'm sure people will disagree with me, is that we're kind of talking about the utility of art, but this is kind of opening up new utilities 
for uh, revenue streams or ideas, depending on what we're doing. And there are different shades and what the authorship can be and what the art is from what a lot of the people on this call have considered not art when, when it comes to the Yacht Club, right? Uh, to uh, art without an author, which is what we've been uh, 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 talking about towards the end here, to the uh, purely utilitarian uh, DeFi MVT applications that Andrej and um, uh, uh, Fab have been talking about. And apparently Fab has written about. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, what's what's the difference? Uh, I mean, there, there is no difference <laughs> between art and utility, but it depends on what we're talking about. There's a reason why we're talking about layers and there's a reason why we're talking about what the specific test case is, because each has its own um, matrix uh, between the art and the utility. Thank you, everybody. Thank, th thanks for joining us today. Um, and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Bye from Grokchain. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.